In our theme for these uh, Sundays during the fall, we were talking about the whole great transference, crossing over from death to life, you know, from darkness to light. And when you think about uh, those that are um, very specifically committed to helping extricate people out of human trafficking, you are right at that moment looking at people who are committed to that great crossing over where people can come out of death-dealing ways and into the life of, of liberty, into justice. Boy, that's just such a, such a big deal. And I, I just want uh, you to, again, remind yourself that the matter of human trafficking is not a faraway problem, but that, you know, in our region, in Pierce County and King County, there, it, there, are, there is an active human trafficking a ring, several rings, much going on in that regard, and uh, preying upon uh, the vulnerable. And uh, so let's just, um, you know, you may not know much to do, but there are ways through websites like this and other websites that you can check out. There are ways to find out how you can be uh, aware and how you can pray more intelligently. And um, maybe if God calls you into something like this, you can uh, step forward into that. Because uh, Jesus is about life, right? It's not about death. Right. So crossing over, crossing over. And we see that, that in Christ, there's this way that we cross over. The cross is always going to be at the center of what it means to cross over. Whether you have a cross on the platform or on the church steeple, really is not the point. The point is whether or not the cross is being lived in your own life. Whether you're learning how to find a way to abandon yourself to God, to release yourself fully to the life that God has come to give you in Christ, to be an instrument in his hands, to help others come to know this life, it's, um, it's really um, actually a very, very dramatic thing. Moving from, from death to life. And as I mentioned last week, that crossing over uh, is a way to enter fully into the life that Jesus has for us. It is the way that God shapes us to become the kind of follower of Christ who experiences and represents Jesus passionately and humbly. So all this uh, teaching that we are doing and kind of exploration of God's word around this theme over these, these weeks um, in these uh, fall months have to do with the issue of really uh, tapping into the God story that longs to be uh, unleashed within your life, this God story, this uh, what God is actually, actually doing within your life. Uh, this week I was, um, I, I was having a, a kind of a time of quiet um, early in the morning, uh, kind of as I do with uh, bringing myself before God and offering myself to him and uh, crying out for his help because I'm always in over my head, right? If you know what life is like, and I had, I had on the one hand, I had this, um, these stresses and challenges that I was going to be facing in my life this week, and uh, and then on the other hand, I had this scripture that I blessed you with, spoke to you uh, after we uh, sang uh, these songs, that um, I pray that God the Father would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you would know Him better, that you would know the hope of your salvation to which you were called, and the inheritance that is yours, and the power. And I and I listened to that, and then I looked at this, and I asked the question, God, what does this have to do with that? What is, I mean, what's the connection between this and that? Because if there really isn't any connection, then you know, then what are we doing, right? But there is a connection. And so I just began to ask. And I didn't have, I didn't have ready, uh, you know, pastor answers for that. I mean, I was really asking. So it's, it's really good sometimes to, to wait with these questions before God and not just to jump to some answers and say, well, what, what are you trying to say fresh and new about that? How do these truths change this person so that the way I walk into this situation is different? Right? I had a professor a long time ago that said, you don't, you don't make the word of God relevant. It is relevant, right? We can marginalize it, 
But when we let it, the word of God have its way and the presence of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the goodness of the Father have his way within us, then there's this relevancy. It's power, powerful. And the whole matter of crossing from death to life is, the, is kind of is like the, the metaphor that, that Jesus uses in talking about our life in him as we spoke of last week. I want to welcome uh, Beth. Would you welcome Beth Mercer? She's here. Hi, Beth. How are you? How's it going? That's good. So I just ran across Beth this week, um, and she uh, she just kind of spilled out this great story. So she's a school school counselor in um, Bethel School District, and uh, she asked permission to share the story. So, man, so it's just kind of an amazing thing, right? I think when God does something really good, we ought to celebrate it. Right, so he's doing a lot of things, but I just wanted you to hear this. Um, so why don't you just tell what you told me, okay? So uh, this last year, I have a student named Ashley. It was in her third year of of her time at Liberty Middle School, and it was actually, and I do have permission, by the way, from the family to share this story. Um, it was actually her mom's birthday, and she was racing home to see her mom at the end of school, just really excited, and was struck um, by a car. And she landed on, this is Ashley, May 16th of this last spring. Um, She was rushed to the hospital. She actually died in the ambulance and was resuscitated. Um, She was resuscitated a couple of times over right away when she was in the hospital. She went through a couple of surgeries within the first couple of days to relieve water on the brain. Uh, She was in a drug-induced coma for about three weeks. And her mom, when she came out of the coma, her mom said she would you know, squeeze her hand. She thought she was tracking with her eyes. The doctor said, you know, that's neural storms. That's pretty normal. But there wasn't really any brain activity going on. And through all of that, our home group was praying. Our prayer team here was praying. We just had, we didn't give up hope for her. But about June of last year, this is her, uh, the doctors came together and they said, you know, there's not the prognosis isn't good for her. We're not seeing any brain activity. You need to take her home, put her in the living room, let her experience life, but this is her now. So early in July, um, there was a Facebook post, and her mom said, I'll reveal the surprise. Ashley has smiled. And um, she went to Children's Hospital the end of uh, July. It was like July 30th, just for a regular appointment for rehab. The doctor started to say, Um, what are you, when is her speech therapy? When is this? When is that? And the mom said, this is kind of our new normal. Now, my prayers at this point had changed for her, and I was praying that God's supernatural power just re-knit her brain because they said that her accents had torn in that accident, and those can't be repaired. Once they're gone, they're gone. And so um, she was admitted. The doctor said, we're going to admit her here to Children's. So last week, I'm sitting in my office, I get a phone call, and they said, "Um, Beth, can you come up to the main office, please? And I was like, yeah, what's going on? They said, there's somebody here you're going to want to see. So I walk up into the main office, and I see out of the corner of my my eye Amy, her mom, and then I look, and in front of me, and my jaw dropped. And I seriously, I thought I was dreaming. I'm like, are you kidding me? And here she is standing in the office. And she was smiling and talking to me. And you can see her wheels turning. It's hard. She had to relearn how to talk and walk and everything. And she starts school the week after next at Graham Kapowson High School. <laughs> yeah. So for the record, I did not ask to be up here. Dave asked me to share this story. No, she begged me. She <laughs> said, please, let me stand up in front of everybody. And as I was praying about what to say today, I said, God, just what, what do I need to share? And um, I brought a picture to my mind of her mom who came in, and her mom had never lost hope. And in fact, she'd wear a T-shirt that said, Faith, Not Fear. And, you know, God just placed on my heart that no matter how broken we are physically, mentally, whatever, there is hope in God. And don't give up hope and keep praying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we rejoice with that family, don't we? We rejoice uh, with them. Um, 
I, I was thinking about how the, the parents feel, the mom, like Amy, would feel about her daughter, and looking at all that and just seeing the, uh, the transformation, and then just recognizing that, oh my goodness, like, this happened, and, um, and how thrilled that, sh that she must be. And when we look at something like this, we think, wow, that is like a radical transformation, right? This is really like something had actually happened. And then it is witnessed, not only by the person to whom it happened, but it's witnessed by everybody around them. And then I think about how Jesus uses such language, such radical transformative language, that you've been brought out of death into life. You've been transferred out of the realm of death into the realm of life. And, and if we only look at that uh, philosophically or if we are only stepping back as though we are observers in this, we may not understand what is really being said. We may, in fact, um, see it somewhat theoretical, but God the Father, who looks at his creation that has been destroyed by the fall and, and all that man has, you know, been able to do in uh, hurting him or herself, then when we look at this and we see God the Father look at his creation in Christ and see now that we've been brought from death into life, can you imagine the Father's heart when he sees that life is pulsating within us? Can you imagine the Father's heart when he looks at us and says, oh my goodness, this is what my son did for you. This is what has happened in you. You're alive now. You're alive now. The most tragic thing would be if once we had been given such a gift like that, then we would then step back and say, well, um, you know, that was all fine and good, but I prefer death right? I prefer death. The unfortunate thing is that we're so accustomed to the death-dealing ways of our old life or of, uh, you know, how we say, well, that's just me or that's just how it is. And rather than leaning into this life-giving and life-shaping relationship with Jesus Christ. You remember last week, the words of Jesus in John chapter 5, 24 were these, Verily, verily, I say, or amen, amen, or I want to tell you something very important. The person who is listening to my word and believing the one who has sent me has a deep, lasting life and is not heading for judgment. Oh, no, that person has been transferred out of the realm of death into the realm of life. So this is what has been declared about anyone who decides to listen attentively to Jesus, listening to my word, and who is trusting and learning to trust in the Father who sent Jesus, that we have come out of, we're out of death into life and we no longer stand under judgment, we no longer stand under condemnation. Isn't that so awesome of a truth? Now there is a response then to give to that, which is so powerful, which is our text for today. And it is chapter 6 in Romans, verse 13, which says this, Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Offer yourself to to God as those who've been brought from death to life see so this is what has happened you have been transferred from the realm of death to the realm of life now offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life in the larger context and you can read the kind of the whole context here even back up to uh, chapter 6 uh, the last part of chapter 5 chapter 6 verse 1 and following that this is really a call to to respond to our, our baptismal reality that we have been, that the, when, we have, when we have embraced Christ and we have declared this in baptism and we, we as those who have been in baptism, we, we identified with Jesus. So when we're, we're buried with Christ in baptism, so you just imagine, right? In the water, when we, as we go under the water, it's like identifying with the burial of Jesus. We're we're dying with Christ. We're identifying with the death of Jesus. And then we're like in an instant, right? We're raised up to new life to experience the resurrection life of God now in our lives. It's, it's like it's a new day. 
It's a new day. Um, I just remember my um, grandson, Elijah, and I, I'll mention him again later, but my grandson, Elijah, when he was little and he was playing t-ball, and uh, he, t-ball, do you understand t-ball? It's very complicated. Uh, but anyway, uh, the jersey he had on, uh, short sleeve jersey, came to here and, uh, and to here. And he stood up there. And uh, he, he, he just concentrated, and it was when, when uh, you know, Chicken Little movie had come out, and he just went like this. He, he just, I just heard him say, today is a new day. <laughs> he then smacked the ball and then ran after it rather than going to first base. But that's another story. <laughs> the whole point is that this is a new day. That's, that's what God wants to register with us. That in Christ it is like... It's a new day. It's, it's a new day when Jesus has done this kind of work within us. The voice translation puts verses 11 through 14 like this. So here is how to picture yourself now that you have been initiated into Jesus the anointed. You are dead to sin's power and influence, but you are alive to God's rule. Don't invite that insufferable tyrant of sin back into your mortal body so you won't become obedient to its destructive desires. Don't offer your bodily members to sin service as tools of wickedness. Instead, offer your body to God as those who are alive from the dead and devote the parts of your body to God as tools for justice and goodness in this world. For sin is no longer a tyrant over you. Indeed, you are under grace and not under law. Wow. So this, this, this Jesus work, by, by embracing with active listening what he is saying and who he is and trusting deeply the goodness and love of the Father who has given us his Son, in doing that, it just, and, and it just changes the game, right? Uh, Lighthouse uh, Church here in uh, Puyallup is, uh, is just in a couple of weeks going to have uh, a new pastor, Brandon uh, Salas, uh, a friend of mine and uh, just a great man of God. And um, as we were sharing about, about this, we were just talking about how Jesus is such a game changer. Like, he just really changes the landscape of everything. Like, I, I love Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And in the message translation, it says this, that Jesus Christ was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything and everyone. And so spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. And you, you yourselves are a case study in what he does. At one time, you had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance that you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There's no other message, just this one, and every creature under heaven gets the same message. I've always been struck by that, that way of, of, saying, of saying it. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You don't walk away. He wants us in the words of one scholar, I love how, how um, Dale Bruner puts it. He wants us to relax in a new earthly reality, the realm of life, and to be deeply grateful for having been extra, extradited from the old realm of death. This is an extradition to be prized and celebrated, enjoyed and believed. Nothing honors the Father and the Son and more manifests the Holy Spirit than when we revel in this transfer of the deep gifts of God from the Father through Jesus. 
to us trusting human beings. Oh, man. Key word in this uh, whole text is offer yourselves. Right? Well, God, if you're doing this for me, then I can't walk away from a gift like this, right? So I offer myself to you. I offer myself to you. You know, um, it's a whole new paradigm. It's a whole, it's a whole, it's a brand new way. It's an unfamiliar way. No, it's, it's really unfamiliar. I, I mean, even if you have been raised around religious things, to come into personal relationship in Christ by um, deeply listening to him and, and trusting the one who sent him to, to, to enter into this new way, it's, uh, it's different, man. It's like really different. It's, um, it's, it's like I said, it's unfamiliar territory. It's, um, it's not like you ever say, oh yeah, I know how to do this life. No, no, you don't know how to do this life. That's why you need God all the way through this teaching and, and accompanying you and empowering you and like giving you insights and, and giving you those aha moments where you realize, oh my goodness, I've been living kind of a, a death life and I, I need to now step in and become what I have been made to be in Christ. I, I was at a... Uh, uh, a difficult and beautiful memorial service last Sunday afternoon for a young man who had taken his life. And uh, the words of the friend who gave the message of hope, it's amazing, like in that setting, there was a message of hope. It's just like incredible. I was so moved. I leaned over to Lynette and said, this is the best message at a memorial service I've ever heard. It was so good. But at some point in that presentation, that, that hope-filled message. He quoted the Heidelberg Catechism. And, uh, it, you know, it's a series of questions and answers. And, and uh, the first question one is this, and it's answered. Question one, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And uh, the answer is this, that I am not my own but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work, must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by the Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. This is my only comfort in life and in death. It's just, I listen to those words and my heart just goes, yes, that's, it's so whole life, right? It's so, this salvation, this relationship with God is so whole life. He is the one through whom we cross over from, de from, from death to life. It, and it changes everything here and now. I once, I once heard, um, change is inevitable, but growth is intentional. I, I think that's true. Change is inevitable. I once had a lot of hair, flowing hair. Change is inevitable. Uh, this, uh, when we had a family reunion this summer, and uh, <clears throat> my, um, again, the, the grandson who played t-ball is, is, now, is now driving. <laughs> and uh, so I needed to pick up my motorcycle at the, at the shop, and so I, I said to Elijah, I said, hey, Elijah, why don't you go with me? You can drive my car back. 
and uh, once you drive and I'll you know ride with you so you get used to the car and so we did that and you know he did he did really well and um, so coming back um, right I rode my motorcycle he followed he's very very cautious uh, driver which is like a good thing but maybe he's too cautious a little bit but you know but cautious driver but he made it all the way back and then and then the next day he he calls me up and he says hey papa he says uh can i take the car to the safeway <laughs> and i go well uh do you know the way to safeway he says no but sam does sam is 12. <laughs> right. so i said all right things are changing right things are changing so he took the car brought back both the car and sam and it was a <laughs> It was a good day. Change happens, right? I mean, change is going to happen, right? You cannot, like, you can't, like, you can't, like, hold the moment. I mean, you know, you can relish the moment, but you can live in the moment. But the moment is going to pass. Change happens. Growth is intentional. You don't accidentally slip into a healthy marriage. You don't accidentally stumble into reconciliation. Yeah. And while growth is intentional, it is really based upon the very intentional work that God has already done and the place he has already put you. He's taken you out of the realm of death and he's put you into the realm of life. He's already, there's already, you've, you've already changed, right? And so when you pray the Lord's Prayer and says, your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you're, you're actually saying, you're not really praying only for some future kingdom that might come, but that right now, like right now in this place, there might intersect into my life at this very moment the realization of the kingdom of God, what it means that Jesus is Lord over my life in this relationship, in this circumstance. This is... And, and you're very intentional about it because you prayed it. You're praying it and you're leaning into it. And you're leaning into it. So you step intentionally into this. So they're, they're just, to help us get a grip on this new reality, there are several things that we learn from, from this passage of Scripture. The, the first is just don't ever forget what I just said. Jesus has done something powerful for us and in us. He has transferred us from the realm of death to the realm of life. So, you know, part of learning how to be a follower of Christ is to get used to our new surroundings. <laughs> so our new, our new surroundings are we've been brought out of death into life. And this, even though we live in this world and we live around brokenness, and we ourselves are to still a great degree still broken, <laughs> but there's, there's something new happening. Like there's, you know, there's a lot of ways you could talk about. There's a wind blowing you know, there's a river flowing. There's there's a, there's rain on on dry ground, right? There's hope in the offering. There's uh, there's um, the gifts of the Spirit. There's the grace of God. There's all these things. I mean, we live we live in um, a new land, right? As 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 the message says about our new life, we live in a we live in a grace sovereign country so good and as we do that we must understand it still takes time to be transformed fully into this new reality of life in him I'm, i i gave you this quote last week but it's worth saying again it takes time to be made free from sin on every level where we are held captive it is painful to be separated from the bias to self and to be prodded to follow Jesus. It takes time for conversion to be made complete and for the Spirit to lead us into deeper love for God and neighbor. It takes time for our baptismal initiation to work itself out into a holy life. It just takes time, but that's, that's okay. Just let the grace of God do its work and be intentional about yielding to him. Amen? Just, just let, take the brakes off, right? Start letting it, letting it happen. He says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So I learned uh, from a mentor of mine, uh, a South African pastor who had overcome great prejudices and now was uh, a pastor in England, London. He, uh, he, he just taught me so much about the issue of, 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 
of how, how, to, how to deal with like the thing we call sin within our lives. Don't let sin reign as a power over your life. There may be sins, but deal with those and don't let sin as a principle in your life rule your life. Let Jesus rule your life. So, so he says, don't let sin reign in your body. Sin always aims to reign. Uh, just, this was very helpful to me. Um, very helpful. Uh, when, when there's something like loveless or selfish or prideful or alienating or damaging or hurting uh, within my life, it is important for me not to say, well, you know, that's just a small percentage of what's going on. Um, overall, I'm doing really well. And just ignore it. Don't. It says, because sin aims to reign. So that little inch that I give to my justification for why I am loveless or bitter or hateful or unforgiving or, uh, you know, you know, so distracted. If, don't let sin reign because sin aims to reign. Years ago, really, we, we talked about the issue. There, there's, there, there's no such thing as successful sin management. Right? Sometimes we say, well, I'll just manage it. Or sometimes we just, I'm using M's now to help you remember, right? Sometimes I say, I'll just manage it. Sometimes I say, I'll just make up for it, right? Like there's, I did something that was unlovely or loveless and, uh, or, or selfish and prideful and hurtful to others. And so I'll say, well, I'll just make up for it. I'll try to do something nice now. But the, only the blood of Jesus takes away sin. My good deeds don't make up for it, right? So I'm constantly dependent upon what Jesus has done for me. So don't just try to manage it and because it will outwit you. Do not try to make, just make up for it and certainly don't minimize it, right? So we say, well, it's nothing. I mean, after all, look at all the sins of other people. I mean, I know people who do a lot worse, right? So don't minimize it, right? Don't let sin reign in your mortal body, right? Uh, we're reading, reading a book recently called, uh, on leadership, Christian leadership, called uh, Canoeing the Mountains, um, there's, a, there's a statement. It says, nobody who starts with a conviction intends to abandon that conviction when the heat is turned up. No couple who pledges till death do us part intends to be sitting in a lawyer's office dividing up the couches and flat screen TVs. No parent who draws a line of expectation in the sand intends to cave when the arguing starts with his teenager. No leader who intends no, no leader who plans to take her people to the promised land intends to hightail it back to Egypt. Nobody who declares that they will follow Jesus intends to deny him three times in one day. But we do more often than we want to admit. And no matter how strong our convictions, we all know that sooner or later we might suffer from what Edwin Friedman calls a failure of nerve. <laughs> and, and we fail. But here, here's the good news. There's always plenty of grace. So where sin abounded, grace much more abounds. Amen? I mean, I love the statement of, of John Piper on his uh, a book on grace that he wrote. Oh, there's this one line that says, the grace, you've heard me say it perhaps, the grace that you have received is infinitesimal compared to the grace that is yet to come. So the good news for me, for my, 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 my life, <laughs> is I haven't even begun to use up all the grace that there is. Amen. Isn't that awesome? There's, there's grace yet to come. So, so don't try to hide, minimize or, or manage or, you know, make up for it. Just turn to God in grace and don't let sin reign. If you see it happening, you just, like, deal with it. And the way you deal with it, you just say, ah, that's sin. That's my sin. I confess it is my sin. Jesus, I'm totally reliant upon the blood that you shed for me on the cross to wash me and to bring forgiveness. 
I don't try to justify myself. I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm just going to be, it's just where it is, and I'm just going to receive your grace, forgiveness, your mercy, your goodness. Set me free. There's more than enough grace, so offer yourselves. Offer yourselves to God. Well, this is really the Jesus way. Jesus himself said, I've come to do your will, O God. You can make a general offer and just say, God, I am yours. But I guarantee you, you're going to have to make specific offers along the way. So in Gethsemane, the night before, the, the, the prayer before he is betrayed, and the day, night before he is crucified, he says to God, not my will, but your will. I specifically say yes to you. I specifically offer the parts of my body to you. For some of us, that means we're going to have to offer our eyes, our our mouths, right, our hands, our thinking to God. Offer the parts of your body to God as instruments of his goodness and justice. And don't offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness or as weapons of wickedness. Don't do that. Because you are no longer under law. You are under grace. There's no longer an external thing saying, be good, behave, you know, shape up, live right. There's not external law trying to form this in you. There's internal life welling up within you. The life of Jesus. You've been brought from death to life and grace reigns over your life and sin is no longer your master. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. We are so deeply indebted to, to you. Uh, but it's not a debt that you hold over our heads. It's an invitation that that you, uh, that you utilize in our lives to just draw us more deeply into Christ. Thank you, Lord. So I just, I just want to ask you, by, just by way of, uh, of a ministry time now, and um, in a moment we'll stand. I'll ask the prayer ministers uh, to come forward. And, and if you just want somebody to pray over you, or maybe you just say, you know, today I am going to, uh, maybe you've n never done this or not for a long time, you're just going to step forward and you're going to offer, and you're just going to say, I offer myself to God as one who has been brought from death to life, right? And, uh, and I guess you can just do it standing wherever you are. But if you want, like, someone to, but actually do it, right? But if you want someone to actually pray for you, because sometimes there's a lot of power in, in just naming it, in, in that I need, I need, I'm offering myself to God and, and not to this particular attitude that's been destructive or this behavior or habit or you know, perspective, you're just stepping forward and you're just, maybe you're just saying, man, I want to live like this, right? Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, um, the night before his, the night before his assassination, uh, he told his supporters, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't really matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. And like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. I just, and so sometimes we're always worried about all these things. But what if we just said, I just want to do his will, right? Let's stand. Yeah, uh, prayer ministers come. And just as we sing, if you want to be prayed over, uh, the doors open and freedom freedom is is ours right in Christ amen